Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lois Zamora, and I teach in the English department and also in history and in art history. And um, I'm glad to see all of you here. As you know, we're taping this course for future use, and so I'm very interested to say hello to future students even now. Um, we'll see how this semester goes and hope that uh, these tapes will be useful for an online class in the future. So I will remind you to push your microphone when you push the button when you want to speak because students in the future will be interested in hearing your comments. Uh, you have the syllabus in front of you, of course, it's posted on our website as well. I'd like to go over it just for a moment and speak about the aims of the course. This is a course, as you well know, that is cross-listed as a history course and an English course. I don't know how many of you have taken cross-listed courses before. But usually we don't do those at the U of H or any place else. There's the English department and the history department and so and psych and econ and business and so forth. But when I became a student about 30 odd years ago of Latin American fiction, I can tell you how that happened. Um, I realized that Latin American fiction many, many times is interested in telling the history of the place. And if we think of 100 Years of Solitude, or we think of Isabel Allende's The um, House of the Spirits, think of any number of Latin American novels. And it's very hard to get away from the idea that these people are telling, these authors are telling the story of their countries, of their people of their historical experience, but they're doing it in a novel. I loved it when I came across the statement at the top of your uh, syllabus by the novelist Carlos Fuentes, whom we will read this semester, his book, which is a history book called The Buried Mirror, but a very novelized, a very personal history by Fuentes of, of Spain and Latin America. He writes as follows, and I liked it and I put it at the top of the syllabus because it strikes me as correct. He says that the real historians in Latin America are its novelists. Now, you'd think that can't be because novelists write fiction, but we're going to see that fiction, in fact, are very intricated, imbricated in, in the novels we're looking at, and indeed in the history that we're looking at. So I go ahead to say we'll examine this premise by reading a number of novels by contemporary Latin American writers and discussing the historical events and personages depicted therein. Our interest is in how these novels dramatize the history of their regions and how their fictional versions, versions illuminate our understanding of the real history of Latin America. You start, we start to put quotes around real history or true events or even the word fact because we see that how those things are narrated uh, has everything to do with their meaning. So this combination of how the story is told and the material upon which the story is based or the narrative is going to be what our concern is in this class. Okay, so you'll keep an eye as you start your reading to say, how is the guy telling this stuff? How, how is the novelist, and I say guy because I'm sorry to say we don't have, oh yeah, we have one woman, I'm sorry, Elena Garro on our syllabus. Oftentimes, uh, my syllabi are overweighted toward male writers, and I don't quite know why that is, except some of the most brilliant ones happen to be men. There's some pretty brilliant women, too. But in any case, the question is how the story is told, how the narrative is structured. We can say that that's the question in any literature class, but now we're looking at how the narrative is structured in order to tell a story that is factual or that happened, at least according to most people's uh, understanding of things. So our first week, this week, on Thursday, I hope to see you. And I hope that you will have read Octavio Paz's essay called Mexico and the US. It's on our website your first week. And there's also a timeline which you have in your hand. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. As you read this essay for Thursday, will you make two columns? One is going to be US and one's going to be Mexico. And I want, he's comparing the two cultures. He says we're two versions, two separate versions of Western culture. Then he looks very 
trenchantly, I think, very economically, very brilliantly, as he is Octavio Paz, Mexican writer, now deceased, Nobel Prize winner, poet, and essayist. He looks brilliantly at how we are different, we being the U.S. as opposed to Mexico. That we gets blurrier and blurrier as our cultures um, meld more and more, Mexico and the U.S. But I think I just start here because it's a way to think about how our past lead to very different forms of Western civilization, as he puts it. Then we're going to start a trilogy on second, third, and fourth weeks by Eduardo Galeano. There are three books. That's what a trilogy means. He's looking at the history in a very literary way of the Americas from prehistory, the myths of indigenous peoples, to 1984, when he uh, stops, when he finishes this trilogy. You're going to see that it's a very particular kind of novel or history. It's neither. I never know what to call it. I call the little vignettes. They're going to be half page, sometimes quarter page texts about a particular historical personage, an event, a place, and it's always labeled with a date and a place name. And he, it can be the, starting, as I say, from the conquest, again with those quotes, the defeat of America, if you want, um, with Cortes and with Columbus and with Vespucci and all of those uh, explorers, as we sometimes call them, um, to adventurers is a word I like better, um, brilliant adventurers. Um, it, nonetheless, he looks at them in ways that are literary, that are ironic, that are historically based. Hurry and get those books. There should be some in the bookstore otherwise go online. There is, as I put, as I say in the syllabus, there is also a one volume version of this trilogy. I happen to use the, the uh, three volume section, but, um, or the three volume version, but it doesn't matter because uh, every piece, every vignette, every piece of this mosaic, which is America from beginning to end, if you can imagine, well until 18, 1984, uh, is uh, given a date and a place. So you can easily go to the date uh, of the event. And we don't have to worry about pagination of different um, editions. Okay, so we're going to spend some time doing that. I'm going to go on and on and on. You'll see. I might, might ask some of you to help me out with some of these vignettes. I ask you to read them all. They're, you'll see. How many of you have taken a look at Galeano? Anybody so far? You'll see that it's it's a different uh, a different kind of way of reading. I tend to open at any place and say wow, and then I it's it's doesn't doesn't. Uh, some, for me, anyway, urge a continuous reading, but I want you to make your way through, whether you start in the middle or the beginning or the, the end and work whichever way I want you to have those books, those three books under your belt. I think you'll find them very enjoyable. I think it's like popping peanuts, you know, you just keep, oh, that's neat. And we'll talk about the structure more, but make sure you have the first volume of that trilogy by next Tuesday and indeed have read some of it because it doesn't do me any good to, to talk about it if you haven't read it uh, by the time you come to class. So read at least into it. Then we're going to do the writing lab assignment that I've talked about. This is for, of course, you all and not for future semesters. Um, we talked about that and you have your sheet on that, that assignment. We continue on then with Carlos Fuentes' The Buried Mirror. Uh, you'll see that I've marked chapters for your progression. If you don't keep up with the reading in this class, you really are going to have trouble. In fact, I have to say I give reading quizzes because I want you to keep up. And so the eighth week, which already is a long time before we have a reading quiz, um, I'm, I ask you to have read those assigned chapters. And I just, a reading quiz for me is to make sure that you've done the reading. And that's all there is to it. It doesn't mean that you have to have brilliant ideas about the text. It doesn't mean anything except that if you've read the book, I ask simple questions that you will know about. I'm not giving reading quizzes for Galeano. It's too hard. There's too much information. There's, it, you'll see. It's not like reading through a novel and you say, okay, so who killed whom uh, you know, in the fourth chapter? It's, <laughs> it's not like that. It's much more dense. So we do then Fuentes, and then we move to two novels by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Love and Other Demons, and the General in His Labyrinth. The General in His Labyrinth is about Simon Bolivar, 
I've never taught that novel before, but I decided I would. It's a novel slash biography. It's Garcia Marquez, the very brilliant, another Nobel Prize winner's uh, version of what the great libertador of uh, Granada, that is what is now Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, um, how, how he spent his last hours. It's a very interesting take. Um, as I say, I've not taught it, and so we'll see how it teaches. I have taught Love and Other Demons. It's a very interesting short novel, not as long as if it were 100 Years of Solitude <laughs> or uh, The Autumn of the Patriarch, other of, others of his novels. As you know, may know, Garcia Marquez, I think, is the most famous living writer in the entire world. He sold more books, 1967, his masterpiece, 100 Years of Solitude, was published. Um, it's probably the most influential and important novel of the 20th century. That's saying a lot. But um, he, he made Latin America a part of the literary map of people who aren't Latin Americans. Uh, many people, in, including myself in some ways, Started to, started to think that Latin American literature must be awfully good if it's as good as that novel. Some of it is as good as that novel, in fact. Like, I love the next one that we read, Elena Garro's Recollection of Things to Come, about the Cristero Rebellion in the 1920s in Mexico. So we'll talk a lot about that particular little known war in Mexico that followed the better known war, namely the um, Mexican Revolution. Then we go to a rather difficult novel, not long but difficult, The Storyteller. I, you, I just have set, used that word story a whole lot of times, saying that it's how you tell the story. This novel is about how the story is told and about an indigenous group, an Amazonia, Amazonian group called the Machiguenga, the nomadic that are held together by storytellers who move from one small community to another. So we'll have a chance to think about, indeed, how an indigenous group holds together its identity, its communal identity, through storytelling, which is part of what novels do for us, don't they? And then we go up. Oh, I've got one extra um, love and other demons there. We may or may not need to return to that novel. We probably won't, and um, I may fiddle with that. I give you the final week of the semester to review and to get your papers in to me. The final paper, as you'll see at the bottom of the page, is 30% of your grade. And so we kind of ease up on the, write, the reading in order that you have time to write and think uh, over Thanksgiving and into the final week. OK, so that's a kind of overview of the books we'll be looking at. Um, tell me how you, how you feel about all of that. Any questions or comments so far about that? OK, well, I'm glad that's all crystal clear. Uh, <laughs> let me go on then to the course requirements. Your attendance is absolutely required. I take attendance. If you miss more than three classes before midway point in the semester, it is my policy to drop you from the course. Unless there are excused absences, email me on the website, please. Don't email me on my regular email. You might get lost in the shuffle, but on, I check every morning my, uh, the, my classes online. And uh, do let me know if you have some untoward circumstance that keeps you from the class. But because the talking that goes on in here, we hope, <laughs> is worth your while, and because your exchange with students uh, in the class is worthwhile, I require your presence. The reading is also required. If you can't keep up with the reading, drop the course, please. <laughs> uh, it just, the course is about the books. I can say whatever I want to say. I've just said that what goes on in class is important. I think that's true. But it's only important if you've read the book, right? Or if you're in the process of reading it. So the reading is absolutely required. And the quizzes and the final examination will privilege people who've done the reading. Duh. I mean, <laughs> that isn't something that would surprise you. The quizzes and class participation, meaning attendance, are 40% of your grade. In other words, that you keep with me and keep up during the course of the semester matters a lot to me. And so I, that, that's a larger percentage than either the final or the paper, of course, the final paper. Of course, together, the final exam and the final paper are worth 60%. So it's an easy deal. Just do the reading, come to class, and hey, 
we're fine. The final paper I discuss here, um, we don't have to go over it together, I think it's fairly standard, we'll certainly talk about it more as, as time grows near. Um, I ask you to turn your papers, final papers, into turnitin.com. I've given you the class number and password at the top of your syllabus. So that should be fairly easy. Now I will, just for the for the uh, benefit of our people taking the class online, sh maybe Scott, if you would switch to the uh, web page. This web page, for those of you taking this online, eventually will be much more developed than this. But there is, of course, this web page. And what we have here are web papers that people taking the class later will not, um, will not do, but will be part of the material for the class. Web papers or websites that students have put up uh, about the material in this, in this course. Um, so I think with that, um, I'd like to go on to this handout, which is in week, also on week uh, one uh, in the folder in week one, uh, the timeline, which is just some dates that I feel responsible for giving you. Some of the historians will be used to dates. The literature students among you will say, yikes, I hate dates. I don't know who taught us to hate dates. I love dates because I didn't ever learn them as a child somehow. But um, how can we think about Latin American history if we don't really know which century is which and when all of this was going on? So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to go over the sheet with you. I'd like to ask you to print it out when you get home because the faded type at the bottom and throughout is red, should be red. I, I came into office and Xerox it and I forgot that it would uh, not Xerox well in red. I, I did want to make a distinction which, between the red and the black, which I'll get to in a minute. But does everyone have this sheet and are you looking at it? Let's think for a minute about centuries, okay? The, <laughs> 1492 is a date that we all know, and you'll see down below, I start with 1492, that's the 15th century, right? The 1400s we call the 15th century, right? The 1500s we call the 16th century, and so forth. We're all very clear on this. It's slightly confusing in English. Actually, in Spanish, you don't do that, or in Italian. But let's just say that right now, what I'm concerned with is the 15th and 16th and almost, and in the 17th centuries. Those centuries when America was getting c conquered and colonized, okay? L I put up at the beginning literary and philosophical texts of the time, because you have to think about what's going on in Europe if you want to think about what's going on in Latin America. Of course, plenty was going on in Latin America before the Spaniards and the English and the French and the Dutch uh, arrived. We're not concerning ourselves very much. We'll concern ourselves some with the indigenous cultures of the Americas. But what we're really going to be looking at, because we end novels about the colonization and conquest and colonization of the Americas, is we're interested when that amazing event occurs when Europe, a hugely developed culture, meets America, a hugely developed well, both sets of cultures, one not knowing that the other existed. It's kind of, like, to me, it gives me chills. If you read, if you read Columbus, you know, Columbus thinks it's kind of a nice place he's found. He thinks it's probably China, and he thinks he'll probably be rich. You do realize that Columbus dies disavowing that he's ever discovered anything new. He, he says no on his death, but he says, no, this is China I've discovered. This isn't, this isn't anything new. Why, why would he do that? Because he was a very good Catholic. To say that he discovered something that wasn't contemplated by the Catholic Church was heresy. It took Amerigo Vespucci, as you might know, who sailed further south. You know, the four voyages of Columbus are all into what is the Caribbean. He does hit the, the tip of South America. See, this is where I should have my map projected. I'll do that in a minute. Um, he, and he says, boy, there's something here that doesn't seem like it's Cathay, doesn't seem like it's China. It takes Amerigo, Amerigo Vespucci, another brilliant adventurer, seaman, Italian, to go down further down the coast of South America. And he says, no, there, this is not on any maps, whether Catholic, whether whatever. He says something is new. So it is kind of nice that Amerigo gives his name to the Americas, because it is he who first says, look, this is something that no map in Europe has ever contemplated. A big risk. 
the Catholic Church continued to fight that, uh, but not for long. They, 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 the, the Catholic Church con said, fine, okay, there's got to be something here that we haven't yet quite, quite understood. But I have Galileo on here for a reason, too. But, okay, so the literary and philosophical texts, you don't have to care about those in particular, but if you've read Shakespeare, and certainly you will have if you're an English major, then figure that w the time period we start by talking about is around the time of Shakespeare. Shakespeare bridges the 16th and 17th centuries. His death date is the same as Cervantes, the author of the Don Quixote. I put René Descartes because if any of you follow philosophy, you know that Descartes is really blamed, I think, for a lot of m modernity's uh, ills, unfortunately, I mean, unfairly, I think. But Descartes is fiddling with the nature of consciousness, with the nature of how the self knows in ways that are utterly new. And he says the self, the, the mind is one thing, the body is something else. It's, I, I, he's blamed for the mind-body split of um, modernity. We don't need to go into to that at all. I just put him there because these are these five writers that I put here really are the beginning of modernity. And that Latin America and the U.S., of course, as well, the Americas are part of this beginning of the world we know now, the, the, the modern world. Colonized in very different ways, as Octavio Paz will explain to you in your reading for Thursday. But nonetheless, I, I, I think we have to see that the world is becoming, even as Columbus is sailing the ocean blue, is becoming the world that, that we know. That That's too simply put, probably. Um, a lot of things have changed since 1492. But modernity with a cop capital M, I take to mean not just the 20th century. I take it to mean from the Renaissance forward. The Renaissance is the 1400s. It's 1500s in, in uh, England, a little later. What monarchies are we concerned with here? That is, what rulers? The monarchies are not nothing, hey? They, these are guys that have huge power. In Spain, it's the Habsburgs for the um, centuries we're concerned about here, the 16th and 17th. And the Tudors, they're a little earlier, but the English Tudors we have to care about. We're not going to look much at North American settlement. In fact, it's not even happening very much at this time. But I want you to n notice these, the, uh, the one website I happened to pull up by accident is on Charles V, one of the great kings, a great colonizer, a great Catholic, it depends on how you feel about these things, but he was a great ruler, he was a great administrator, he was born in Ghent in Belgium. But he marries into, Charles I, it's not even the marriage I mentioned, he married, the Habsburgs were the holy Roman emperors. They ruled Europe during the Dark Ages, Central Europe. How does that get over to Spain? Well, Charles V, who's also Charles I, he's the Charles I of Spain, Charles V of the uh, Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, Empire. He marries the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. Now, we all know Ferdinand and Isabella because they're the Catholic kings, as they're called, who funded Columbus, right? So very shortly after the Catholic kings, Ferdinand and Isabella, we get this union of Central Europe, Northern Europe, and Spain that makes um, Charles the, the first eventually makes the Habsburgs rulers of half of the known world because by the time they conquer the Americas, they conquer the Philippines in the middle 16th century, uh, the Moluccas, they uh, begin to... So there's a statement by the end of the 16th century by Philip II, the sun never sets on the Spanish Empire. Why? Because the Spanish Empire circles the globe. So there's this huge moment of imperialism I'm not going to go through the English tutors too much. The detail with the marriages that I mentioned is they kept trying to get together. England and Spain wanted to rule the world together. So we have Charles marrying, marrying Henry VIII's half-sister. We have Bloody Mary, who, fought, who basically, well, she precedes the Virgin Queen Elizabeth. I should have put Elizabeth down here. Elizabeth's half-sister. She marries Philip II, but then she dies shortly thereafter. See the movie called Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett, and you'll learn all about Bloody Mary. It's more about 
her, who's Bloody Mary, the daughter of Henry VIII and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, a Spaniard. She's Catholic. That's why she's called Bloody. She tries to reimpose Catholicism, and a lot of Protestants die. Remember that Henry VIII, we'll see it down here in my timeline, has already broken with the Catholic Church. But the irony is that after his sickly son, Edward VI, reigns for a short period, and then Bloody Mary for another short period, we have Queen Elizabeth, who reigns until 1603, I believe, when she, she dies. She takes over in 1658 and reigns until 1603. So, of course, the great Elizabethan period with Shakespeare, with, with Christopher Marlowe, with all of the authors that we know and love, if we're literature students, uh, that happens under uh, Elizabeth I. But my point in putting these two monarchies is we're going to encounter them again, and certainly we're going to encounter these Charleses and Philips, who are the Spanish Habsburgs, who, ro who rule for two centuries the 1500s and the 1600s, or the 16th century and the 17th century, as we call those centuries. The Great Period, the Baroque Period, is under, um, under the Habsburgs. Then in 1700, right on the nose, zero, zero, the French Bourbons take over the rule of Spain and its colonies, and things change, and we're going to see how they change. The Bourbons are much more rationalist. They're, less, they're Catholic, but they're less Catholic. Um, Eventually, the Jesuits are tossed out because the Jesuits are too Catholic and too powerful, the Bourbons. So the Bourbons start to, if you want, modernize uh, some of the colonies under Spanish rule, but um, there are other details to, to be seen there, too. So keep these guys in mind. I want, on any final exam in this class, Habsburgs and Tudors is going to come up. Be sure of it. You might start thinking about your web papers even now. Now, unfortunately, my red and black won't look very good here. Um, the red is the lighter gray. Um, I put them in because I wanted to distinguish the black and what was going on in the Hispanic world and in Spain, and then meanwhile in the rest of Europe the stirrings of modernity with the Protestant Reformation and the new science. So I just, we don't have to talk too much about these things, but so you understand the context. Here is Spain. Let me just, Spain is so interesting because it's so different from the rest of, of Europe in, in, in many ways. And of course, Spain, as we'll find out in Carlos Fuentes' The Buried Mirror, doesn't unify very well even even today. I mean, there's the Catalans and the Basques and the Andalusians and the Gallegos and so forth, different languages spoken within Spain. As you know, the Basques are separatists. They want to be. So, so Spain has always been a kind of odd combination of parts. But what happens in 1492, not only the discovery of America, but look at 1492 down at the bottom of your first page. There is the conquest of Granada, the last Muslim, or as it's called in, when you talk about Arabic, Muslim, Spain, you say Moorish. I don't know, Moor. So the last Moorish stronghold in southern Spain. The conquest by whom? By the Catholic kings. Ferdinand and Isabella are not only exploring and funding Columbus, they're trying to get the Iberian Peninsula together under Catholic rule. So we've got to get rid of the Moors, who had already been pushed back to Granada. Has anybody been to Granada and seen the Alhambra, the Alhambra? Very beautiful. Go. It's fabulous. And even in all of, of Spanish and therefore Mexican architecture, you'll see Moorish influence. The interior patio with the fountain in the middle is absolutely Moorish. The tile work, the azulejos as they're called in Spanish. Azul is a word that comes from the Arabic, any word that starts with al, alhambra, algebra, etc. About a quarter of the words in Spanish are of Arabic origin. But what happens in 1492, the Catholic kings conquer that last stronghold. They say, get out of Spain. What happens to these people that go, go to, to Morocco, to northern Africa? Then the third group, the expulsion of the Jews. We can't have any Jews here if we're going to be consolidating Spain for, Catholic, uh, for the Catholic Church. Very cruel expulsion of the Jews. A third are murdered. A third, you'll learn more about this in the Buried Mirror with Carlos Fuentes. A third are murdered. A third convert. There is the possibility given to Jews to convert. You'll find that J Jewish names or Jewish families, like sacristan, iglesias, words that are Santa Maria, words that are very Catholic. 
Jews took Catholic names or place names. Samorta, my last name possibly is, a, my, it's my husband's name, possibly a, uh, a Jewish rooted name. So, the, so, but even so, it's it's a category. The the new Christians, as they're called, the converts are are looked upon uh, as second class, and another third went elsewhere, and they continued to speak Ladino, medieval. Spanish, if you want, until really, until lately. Some people still speak Ladino. A big group went to Turkey. It took World War II to exterminate that diaspora of, of Spanish Jews. In Salonika, terrible in, in Morocco, actually, there remained Spanish Jews who were very identified with the language of Ladino and with, but the point is here, what's going on in Spain? Spain's casting out difference. Get out of here, get out of here. We want to all be the same. At the same time, it's conquering difference. That is, at the same time, it's encountering difference, which is America. All those indigenous peoples with all of their amazingly different uh, cultures and languages. So there's this irony about the time, this time that we will see early on in Spain, and we'll see it with the first volume of Eduardo Galeano, with the first chapters of Carlos Fuentes, this, this kind of contradictory dire, desire to, to expand at the same time that we want to draw around the wagons and all be Catholic and all be the same. So there's a kind of, a kind of irony there. But what's going on with my red type at the bottom of the page? Erasmus is in praise of folly. Erasmus will become important for the Reformation. Um, I refer to, he was a clergyman, but uh, also a philosopher, important in Spain. He went to Spain. Sir Thomas More's Utopia. Utopia is based, as you probably know, on chronicles that were coming out of the New World. Martin Luther, 1517, everybody should know that date. It's when he said no, no more to Catholic abuses. You remember he was German and he nailed up his 95 theses saying no more of this, no more of that, no more indulgences, no more uh, corruption on the part of the church. He had no idea he was starting what is called Protestantism, based on the word protest, as you know. Um, but. We, this is terribly important. At the same time, the church, the Catholic Church in Spain, is trying to make everybody Catholic. We have a few Catholics, and more than a few. By in 30 years, one third of Catholics had decided to leave the Catholic Church for Protestant. That's that is had decided to protest. The Protestant religions come up slowly, but um, so there's this rebellion in the north that needs to be put down. It's to the reason today that Holland is Protestant and Belgium is Catholic because that was all Spanish territory. There was a huge war that went on. Finally, the Dutch Republic said, "No, we are we are separating from from the Spanish Empire. We're going to be Protestants," and they made it stick. A lot of the expelled Jews from Spain also went to Amsterdam, which welcomed welcomed the great talent of, of Jewish exiles, and it was very responsible for Amsterdam in 50 years becoming a major world uh, power. So uh, all of this moving around has to be explained, at least in part, by religion. You never forget that I mean, you can't talk about Latin America without knowing about the Catholic Church and its problems with the Protestant Church, especially during the 16th century. So we're, that's where we're still in the 16th century. Keep going. 1521, the conquest of Mexico Tenochtitlan by Hernán Cortés. We're going to see that, of course. He lands in Veracruz from Cuba in 1519. It takes him a couple years to get across mountains. He goes in between the great volcanoes of Popo and Ixta, if you know Mexico City. Um, he gets, and he, Moctezuma comes out and welcomes him as a returning god, and so forth and so on. We're going to read about that. 1521, okay, so we got 1517, you gotta know that. Martin Luther, 1521, you gotta know that. 1521. It's easy to remember, because 1620, the bottom of your page, 99 years later, the pilgrims land on Plymouth Rock. A hundred years rounded off later, North American colonization than Mexican. By 1620, Mexico City is a booming capital, huge amounts of wealth. All of Mexico has been, quote, colonized. Peru, um, 
I was just in Antigua de Guatemala, beautiful city, fabulous. By 1543, it's doing fine, you know. So the Spaniards, the minute they figured out they had a new territory, they began to exploit it for money, for souls. The spiritual conquest was very important, too. But, okay, so 1521, Congress. I also put what went on in Spain here, the defeat of communal forces of Castile in Spain. You're going to read about it in Carlos Fuentes. 1533, now skipping back to England, Henry VIII breaks with the Catholic Church, and Thomas More is beheaded in 1535. Thomas More was a cleric, and he didn't agree with this divorce. See that wonderful Man for All Seasons movie? There's also lately one on Thomas More, a very, very interesting figure. I put that in red because it's in Europe, of course, but it, it looks gray, but it's red. But it's also because Henry VIII, we know, we know the story, all of us, of Henry VIII, right? He had six wives. He beheaded, I forget, he beheaded three, and he divorced two, and one outlived him or something. Now I can't quite tell you, but Anne Boleyn is the most famous, the second wife who was beheaded. And he kept getting rid of wives, partly because he was looking for a male heir, partly, I don't know, because he was largely crazy, I suppose. <laughs> but. Um, it, he wasn't a reformer, and yet he wanted to break with the Catholic Church for his own reason. He wanted divorce, and the Catholic Church said no. So he becomes part of the Protestant Reformation, even though he's not like Martin Luther, incensed by Catholic press or a moral figure, a moral purveyor. He, he, he just wants his way. And so I put that in red. The red is really more the, the modernizing things. Copernicus. Copernicus in 1543 um, says, no, the sun doesn't, how does it go? The earth goes around the sun rather than vice versa. But he doesn't write it up. But the idea is out there. He knows that he is never imprisoned by the Catholic Church, as we know Galileo will be. That's the next gray line, 1616. Galileo puts it down. He, he, by then, he's invented the microscope. He can, I mean, the telescope. He can, he can prove it. So he takes Copernicus's idea, Copernicus's idea and says to the Catholic Church, you're wrong. You've been wrong all along. And the Catholic Church says, no, that will not do. And he's um, put under house arrest. Read the brilliant book called Galileo's Daughter. If you want to learn all about Galileo, she was a nun. She wrote him letters. The letters still exist. The brilliant writer Dava Sobel, S-O-B-E-L, has written that book, and I highly recommend it. You feel like you learn a lot about what it means to be in a convent, the daughter, and, and then, but she takes the trouble. She's a science writer, but she ta I should have put that on the syllabus. That's what I should have done. Um, th that would have been a fun book to, to read together. You learn all about Galileo. He understands perfectly well the danger that he's in. But he's a scientist, and he wants to write. He thinks he has the patronage of one of the popes. He thinks he can get away with challenging the belief systems of the Catholic Church. He can't. Uh, but, of course, in the long run, he's the hero, as we know. Okay, go back up then to our black type, 1545 to 1563, the Council of Trent. What is the Council of Trent? There's a word, it's an adjective, tridentine, and you don't, it's not about gun, tridentine, T-R-I-D-E-N-T-I-N-E. -E. It means the, that which came out of the Council of Trent. It's a perfectly good word in English. The Council of Trent is an ecumenical council, meaning the Catholic Church brings its people from all over the world to talk about things. There was one in the 1960s, most of you are too young to remember, but I do, under Pope John XXIII, an ecumenical council. Why do they need to have a huddle at this point? Because of Martin Luther, because of all those people in the North who are saying, we're, we're out of here. They lost a third of their Catholic believers. So at the same time that they're madly Christianizing, as we'll see in the, the New World, by, by the fifth, middle of the 1500s, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Augustinians are there setting up schools, converting uh, indigenous peoples in, in the Americas. The Council of Trent is very important. I'd love to see a web paper on the Council of Trent. You just have to Google it, um, and you'll find the 25 decrees that came out of three sessions, each of about 18 months. This didn't go on for 18 years. It went on for three different sessions over, the, over this period of 18 years. And it's important for art because the Council of Trent says we must appeal to people's emotions. 
So we have to have the incense smelling a certain way, the music sounding a certain way, and all that beautiful visual art. We must make people think about God through visual means. Imagine the passion of Christ by looking at a crucifix and so forth. A huge distinction and we'll talk about this, between the Catholic attitude toward images and the Protestant attitude. It's which is why when many North Americans who have been raised Protestant go to Latin America and see the incredible wealth, the beautiful gold altars, the statues, the, the bloody Christ, the bleeding Christ, Cristo Sangrantes, as they're called in Spanish, uh, they find it, uh, they, we, Protestant, uh, U.S., find it, overwhelming, find it too much. What is all this wealth about when there's poverty and so forth? The point is that it's part of Catholic policy that worshipers should participate in beauty, and the beauty is defined by the Council of Trent. Of course, it's what it is is Madison Avenue. It's very good propaganda. You want someone to weep salt tears and think of Christ's suffering. You know, you, you don't want, you don't want, but how can, the, how can the Protestants then have bare walls? Think of those colonial buildings in Massachusetts, absolutely bare. Martin Luther says, no, those pictures are an interruption to belief. The, the, the viewer has a vertical, I mean, the, the worshiper has a vertical relationship to God and doesn't need to see all of this in front of him or her. So there's a different attitude toward the image. The Council of Trent is very important. It's the regrouping. It's the, the Catholic Church saying, whoops, we better reform ourselves. It generates what we now call the Catholic Counter-Reformation. There's the Reformation, which creates Protestantism. And when the names Luther and Calvin and others come to mind. And then there's the counter, the reaction, if you want, on the part of the Catholic Church. Counter-Reformation is sometimes said, that's kind of Protestant-centric. It's also called the Catholic Reformation or the Catholic Reform, where the Catholic, says, the Catholic Church says, so we better get on the ball, we better think about how we're doing business. And, and for example, one of the decrees talks about bishoprics, giving out bishoprics. That's a sinecure. Sinecure means a lifetime cushy job where you don't have to work. Bishops didn't even have to live in the part of the country where they were acting as bishops. So there's one part of a degree that says bishops have to live in their bishopric. You say, well, yeah, <laughs> but you realize, and indeed, if you read Galileo's daughter, you'll see he had, a, he had three Ill illegitimate children. He, one was a son. He hoped and hoped and hoped his son would get a sinecure, you know the word S-I-N-E-C-U-R-E, -E. it's one of those lovely vocabulary words, he hoped and hoped that his son would get a sinecure with the Catholic Church, that the Catholic Church would put him on the payroll. Indeed, it finally happened, because he had no other way to, to make money, this son. It's not like going out and setting up your own business was a possibility, I guess. Okay, so the Council of Trent cannot be underestimated in its importance. The Spain, back to Spain, the Spanish are still trying to get rid of the Moors. <laughs> they finally imagine, uh, manage in 1567. The expulsion of the Jews was much quicker because the Jewish, Jewish culture wasn't integrated in the same way that the, the Arabic culture had been in Spain. The Arabs had, Arabic culture, Muslim culture, had been in Spain since the seventh century. So to just say, you know, kind of cut out half of your culture that's really integrated and say goodbye is harder to do uh, than, than the Jewish culture was, which maintained its separate, separateness in a different way. So the Moorish Spain is a great topic for any, and you can choose, there are more and more books about it. I can recommend several, the history of, Arab culture in Spain until this period in the 16th century when Spain is Catholicizing everybody. Okay, just keep going for another two te teeny beeny minute or two. 1588, the Spanish Armada defeated by England. This is where England comes up and Spain by now. You know, the great great century for Spain is the 16th century, the 1500s, but already by 1588, They've, um, they were defeated, as, again, as Fuentes will tell you, by the weather, not the superior force of the English. They, there were storms and so forth. But it's an important, 1588 is a date also you should have in your repertoire. 1598, Philip of II of Spain dies, leaving to his Habsburg successors a ruined Spain. So it only take, there are only two Habsburgs during essentially the whole course of the 16th century, Charles V 
and um, Philip II, his son. Has anybody been to the Escordial in Spain at the great palace that Philip II built for himself about an hour outside of Madrid? You'll see pictures of it and hear discussion of it in, in Fuentes's book when we get there. Um, so over the course of this century, the 16th century, Hispanic America is colonized, is Catholicized, and in a way, the rest is history. If we had uh, all the time in the world, we'd spend a lot of time on the 16th century and then the 17th, the High Baroque. And meanwhile, in North America, look at how short the list is. Now, I should have said, I, uh, North America, I, I should have said something about Canada there, and I didn't. I mean, obviously, the Catholic Church, the French Catholicism was being implanted. Anybody seen that wonderful movie called Black Robe? Make note of the movies when I mention them. I'm not a great movie expert at all, but I know good ones on the historical subject that we're talking about. Black Robe, it's about the, the French colonization of the Iroquois. Um, so I should have put something there. But in, in North America, meaning the US, as it turns out to be, we have Jamestown. It's the 400th anniversary this year of Jamestown. Everybody been reading about that? There's lots. The Queen of England went to Jamestown about a month or two ago visited, you know, there's only foundations there now. Uh, it was a failed colony. It lasted a couple of years. We have, of course, the great myth of um, Pocahontas and James, is it James Smith? Is that John Smith? Anyway, um, Jamestown and then 1620 English colonization begins in in serio begins seriously with the pilgrims 1630 i could have put massachusetts bay colony uh, william bradford all of this the pilgrims being puritans who were furious that england wasn't more reformed already than it was that the reformation was lagging behind in england you remember that the pilgrims as we call them went to leiden in holland for nine years. They hope, well, Holland, already now Holland had separated from the Spanish Empire. Maybe we'll, maybe we can be more pure here. But no, that wasn't good enough yet. So they headed out for uh, the territory that we now call Massachusetts, um, 99 years after the conquest of Mexico. So that's a silly little kind of jumping around. But I want you to think as you read Galeano, as you read um, Octavio Paz for next time and Galeano for next week the first volume, Genesis, uh, I want you to think about some of these things. A very interesting period in time. So with that, I'll let you go unless you have questions uh, about the structure of the class, about what's required, etc. If not, I'll let you go. See you next time.